Hi everyone, it's Dr. Bishop here to give a video about understanding the results of an article about therapy. Going back to what you learned before, there are three steps to critical appraisal. In this video, we're going to go over step two. What are the results of the study about an article about therapy? In this video, I will go over how to interpret the results of an article about therapy and specifically help you understand the treatment effect. So we'll answer the question, what was the effect of the treatment? Let's go back to our article about spironolactone in patients with heart failure. Our PICO question is, among patients with severe heart failure, does spironolactone versus placebo reduce mortality? In this study, the main outcome we were interested in is mortality. That's the O, the outcome in our PICO question. If you look at the article, the researchers actually show many, many results. The results that they're looking at are shown in this section, endpoints. Their primary outcome is death, as you can see right here, from any causes. But they also look at a number of secondary outcomes, such as hospitalization for cardiac causes, death from cardiac causes, the combined incidence of death from cardiac causes or hospitalization, and changes in the New York State Heart Association class. For the purposes of this class and to learn how to read this type of article, I would like you to focus only on the primary outcome, which is death. Let's go back to our study design and think about the outcome. If you remember, patients with advanced heart failure were randomized to receive spironolactone or placebo. And in each of the groups, death from any cause was measured. So what kind of variable is death? Death is a, di a dichotomous variable. Patients either die or they don't. When we look at the results of an article with a dichotomous outcome, we are going to compare the percentage of patients who died in the treatment group versus the percentage of patients who died in the control group. And we'll use statistical testing to see if those percentages are statistically significantly different. To help us organize our thinking, I've made a table. The columns are the control and treatment groups, and the rows are the outcomes in each group. Let's go back to the article to find the values to fill into the table. If we go to the results section in the article, we can see that 1,663 patients were randomized in the study. There were 841 patients assigned to the placebo group and 822 patients assigned to the treatment group of spironolactone. The authors describe a number of patients who dropped out of the study, but remember, they used an intention to treat analysis, so anyone who is randomized to the control group will be analyzed as a control patient, and anyone randomized to the treatment group will be analyzed as a treatment patient. Let's go back to our table and fill in these numbers. There were 841 patients in the placebo group and 822 patients in the treatment group. If we continue to scroll down in the results section, we can see that there were 386 deaths in the placebo group and 284 deaths in the spironolactone group, or the treatment group. Let's go back and fill in these values. Going back to our table, we can put in 386 deaths in the placebo group and 284 deaths in the spironolactone group. We now have enough information to calculate the percentage of patients who died in the control group and the percentage of patients who died in the spironolactone group. As you can see from these numbers, a higher percentage of patients died in the control group, 46%, compared with the treatment group, which only had 35% of patients die. I'd like to go over a few terms that help us understand the treatment effect in a more standardized way. The first term is the control group risk. This is a percentage of patients in the control group who had the outcome. In this case, it's 46%. The next term is the treatment group risk, which is also called the experimental group risk. For this study, it's 35%. In plain language, 
we might say the risk of death in the control group is 46% and the risk of death in the treatment group is 35%. The next term is the relative risk. The relative risk is simply the ratio of the risk for the treatment group over the risk for the control group. For this paper, that is 35% in the treatment group over 46% in the control group, which is a relative risk of 0.76. In plain language, we might say the risk of death in the treatment group is 76% of the risk of death in the control group. The next value we are going to calculate is the relative risk reduction. The relative risk reduction is simply 1 minus the relative risk. In this case, the relative risk reduction is 1 minus 0.76 or 0.24, also 24%. So in plain language, we would say the risk of death is 24% lower in severe heart failure patients who were treated with spironolactone. Relative risk is a value that you commonly read in papers or hear about in the lay press. It's helpful to know the relative effect of a treatment, and it's easy to think about that value. But sometimes relative risk can be misleading. Here's an example. So here are two studies. In study one, the control group risk was 2%, and the treatment group risk was 1%. The relative risk reduction is 50 percent. In another study, the control group risk was 40 percent and the treatment group risk was 30 percent. The relative risk reduction in this study is 25 percent. That's lower than the relative risk reduction for the first study. But as a patient or doctor, what matters more to you? Dropping a risk from 2 percent to 1 percent or dropping the risk from 40 percent to 30 percent? So in addition to the relative risk and the relative risk reduction, we calculate another value called the risk difference, also known as the absolute risk reduction. The risk difference in the first study is 1%, and the risk difference in the second study is 10%. Let's go back to our study and see what the risk difference is. If the control group risk was 46% and the treatment group risk was 35%, we can calculate the risk difference, or absolute risk reduction, as just the numeric difference between those two values, so 46% minus 35%, which is 11%. In plain language, we might say that 11% fewer severe heart failure patients will die if they take spironolactone. As you can see, both relative risk reduction and risk difference give us important and different information. And it's helpful to understand both of those values to understand the treatment effect. Another value that helps us interpret those results is something called the number needed to treat. The number needed to treat is the number of patients that we need to get the treatment to to prevent one death. To help you understand the concept of NNT, or number needed to treat, let's consider a hypothetical example where the control group risk is 100% and the treatment group risk is 50%. How many patients do you need to treat to prevent one death? The answer is two patients. Now that you understand what that means, the formula for number needed to treat is just 1 over the risk difference. In the spironolactone study, looking at our values, we can see that the risk difference is 11%, so the number needed to treat is 1 over 11, which is 9 patients. In real life language, we might say you have to treat 9 patients with severe heart failure to prevent one death. As you start to read articles comparing different therapies, I'd like you to do the following. First, focus on the main or primary outcome. Second, use a table to calculate the control group and treatment group risks. And third, use these values to help you calculate the relative risk, the relative risk reduction, the risk difference or absolute risk reduction, and the number needed to treat. We will practice calculating all of these items in class. 
We will also touch on the issue of statistical testing to determine whether the treatment effect was in fact statistically significantly different from the controlled effect. And we will spend some time discussing how this affects patients. To quickly go over statistical testing, let's look at the article. If we quickly look at what the researchers report, we can see that they use some statistical terminology. I'm not going to expect you to calculate these values, but I expect you to understand what they mean. So they write, the relative risk of death among the patients in the spironolactone group was 0 0.70. And then they show you what the 95% confidence interval is and the p-value. As you can see, the 95% confidence interval is 0 0.60 to 0 0.82 which is less than 1. And that's why we get a p-value that's less than 0 0.05. So we would say that in this study, there was a statistically significant difference in mortality between the two groups. To sum things up, we learned how to read the results of an article comparing a therapy to a placebo. We found that in the spironolactone article, the relative risk was 76%. The relative risk reduction was 24%, the risk difference was 11%, and the number needed to treat was 9 patients. So going back to the three steps of critical appraisal, the last step is how can I apply the results to patient care? This is a really important question and one that we will discuss in class. We'll also discuss many of the items that you have learned in the past few videos. Before class, I'd like you to read through the assigned articles so you're ready to praise it with your EBM team in class.